Hello, welcome. Thanks for coming along this evening. My name is Mark Pascal. I'm the Executive Director of the Blockchain Association of New Zealand, blockchainnz.org. So blockchain.org.nz. Uh, we're a membership-based organisation representing the crypto blockchain community in New Zealand uh, with a mission to uh, help New Zealand become a global hub for blockchain innovation. So always looking for new members, new people to come to get involved. Please drop me a line if you're interested. So I'm going to start with a bit of an introduction into the, the DAO and give you some context uh, and sort of hopefully help, to, help you to understand how this DAO thing fits into, fits into the world. And then uh, Kate will jump, into, uh, uh, jump in afterwards and talk about uh, DAO governance, soft, 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 government, soft governance. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Uh, this video that you're seeing here uh, is called a murmuration. I didn't know that. Uh, it's a bunch of starling birds uh, uh, jumping around, and it's a beautiful example of a complex group decision-making uh, in the absence of hierarchy. So really interesting stuff. So for me, uh, DAOs are really a coming together of, of a whole a number of uh, parts of my life, of my career. Uh, over the years, the first one being open source. So this this concept of developers around the world building highly complex software, uh, working collaboratively, uh, and making the source code free, open to, to anybody. Uh, it's a fascinating uh, concept when I first came across it. The second thing is agile uh, and lean startup. So this this alternative way of, of building stuff, generally software that involves more of an evolutionary purpose. Uh, more, it's more about iterations and experiments, uh, validating assumptions rather than a big upfront design uh, approach. The third strand is, re is this thing called Reinventing Organizations. So this was a book uh, created by a, a Belgium guy called Frédéric Lalou a few years ago. And really, he proposed uh, that organizations should be viewed more like organizations, uh, and therefore function uh, like complex adaptive systems rather than machines. So he proposed the idea of self-managing teams and more purpose-driven organizations uh, changing or taking out all of the hierarchies, no bosses, uh, and very different control structures. And finally, blockchain, which I'll talk about a little bit in a little bit more detail. This, this technology infrastructure that is allowing us to do things we really couldn't do before. So decentralization is, is worth, uh, before it, in order to understand DAOs and the blockchain, we need to understand a little bit about decentralization. And to understand about decentralization, we need to understand about centralization. So uh, this book is really interesting. It came out about 20 years ago. And uh, it, he talks about the structure of society uh, is based on the logic of violence. So what do we, what do we mean by that? So we have this predator-prey relationship between makers and takers. And historically, it's harder to protect, to protect something than it is to, to make it. So in the hunter-gatherer society, it was pretty easy to protect our things. We'd, we'd carry them around with us. Uh, but as society, and so, so we were a very decentralized society. But as society became more complex, we created more things of value. So we had to have bigger entities to protect our things. So we created houses, farms, but we needed armies, and we needed nation states, and we need banks, and et cetera, to help protect those assets. So after, over the last few centuries, we've evolved from a highly decentralized society to a highly centralized society. And the internet has really accelerated that, that, that move uh, to, to, to what many believe, including myself, it's taken us to really quite a dangerous space. Uh, and probably for three main reasons. One, this, this massive global, uh, global scale disintermediation has uh, essentially left a handful of monopolies now taking control of the systems for managing our identity, our data, uh, our reputation. And, uh, and these companies are not elected by us. Uh, they are completely, and so we're, we're completely at, the, at, the, at their mercy. Uh, and they're, they're there to make money for shareholders, and we can't control that. So, and it's very difficult to compete with those organizations uh, due to the network effect. So we're moving to a world where we've got one search engine, one taxi company, one source of news, uh, one shop, uh, one accommodation provider. So this is quite a scary place. The second problem is that as these centralized databases grow, uh, controlled by these mega corporations, so does the target for hackers. 
So the stakes are getting bigger and bigger. A few generations ago, if the bad guys uh, robbed a bank or uh, did something like that, it would affect a few hundred people. These days, if the bad guys are su su successful, it can affect millions and potentially billions of people. The stakes are getting bigger. And how long is it going to be before our, our DNA is available on the dark web to every insurance company? So finally, third reason is uh, that these profit-driven mega corporations and the 200-odd governments around the world uh, in three or four election year election cycles, uh, nobody is looking after the long-term sustainability of this finite resource that we're all sat on, the Earth, the planet. So the incentives simply aren't aligned. Uh, the corporations are there to make money for shareholders, the politicians are trying to get re-elected uh, in, in a couple of years. So this is a big problem. Uh, ten years ago, uh, almost the month, uh, a white paper was released under, uh, by a person under the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto uh, that outlined an incentive structure to create a digital cash uh, that he called Bitcoin. Uh, but more importantly, he created an architecture that we now know as the blo blockchain uh, that gave us a way to create a new breed of peer-to-peer -peer software system that was, that was unique, that had never been before, in that it was tamper-proof, unstoppable, uh, and without any centralized control. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we've got traditional world. On the right-hand side, we've got this new peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer network. Uh, and from this, uh, from this white paper grew this, this global supercomputer, essentially, uh, to support Bitcoin that now has, uses more electricity than Ireland or something like that, and there's a market cap of $70 billion, last time I looked. Uh, so, and Bitcoin was just the first blockchain of many blockchains since then. So the blockchain and other decentralization technologies have given this, us this way to fundamentally re-architect our global systems. And one of the wonderful things about this re-architecture is that it forces us to, to, to go back to some, some first principles. When, when Bitcoin first turned up, we started asking ourselves, what, what is money? The answer would traditionally be it's a system run by governments and banks to, uh, to allow us to, tra to transact. But in fact, cryptocurrency introduces a new concept of money. So a currency that is controlled by an international community-driven laws of transparent, open mathematics, and not by the people of law, not by the people uh, in government, the laws of people in government. So Bitcoin introduced us to this concept of a community-run organization, no, no central control. And, and anybody can join that community. It's, it's not, you can be anybody in the world, uh, there's no restrictions on, on who can join. So the next major advancement in, in decentralization was something called Ethereum. This is a new blockchain. So with the Bitcoin blockchain, it had a very, very narrow scope. It was there to design, one, uh, to, 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 to sort out one problem, digital cash. But Ethereum, uh, created by a young fellow called Vitalik Buterin, uh, who we, we brought over a couple of years ago to New Zealand, he created a blockchain that instead of designing, designing it to build, to solve a specific problem, it was designed as a, as a platform to, allowing, to allow developers to build anything. Uh, so it's kind of a coding platform that we can e execute business logic. And that business logic is now known as smart contracts. So a smart contract is this self-executing bit of code that once it's put on the blockchain, it is guaranteed to execute as, as programmed. And this is really important uh, because it changes the trust relationship. And if I can use an example, uh, if I was in the traditional system, wanted to create a, a gambling website, I was an entrepreneur, I wanted to sort of create a gambling website, I might uh, write some code, put it on an Amazon server and say to the world, come and use my, my website and gamble your money, roll the virtual dice. But you probably wouldn't use my website because you wouldn't trust me. You'd be going, well, hang on, I don't know this guy, I, don't, I can't see what, what, what's going on behind the scenes, what, what the odds are really like, uh, so you wouldn't use my site. But if I, as a developer, could build that application as smart contracts and put that code onto the blockchain so it's transparent, it's immutable, even I, the developer, can't, uh, can't uh, change that code once it's up, uh, then you wouldn't need to trust me as the developer. You would need to trust the code. Uh, and that's, that's the fundamental shift in thinking. And if you, t if you swap gambling for banking, for, for Uber, for Facebook, for anything, uh, we can start to see how we can create new new uh, community-driven systems. So it's so quite exciting stuff. So since Ethereum turned up, we've had other platforms uh, to build smart contracts. So 
EOS and NEM there out there. There's others like Definity and Tezos still in development and a bunch more, more coming. And they're, they're often taking slightly different architectural approaches, but fundamentally they're, they're providing this, these platforms for building smart contracts. So we've entered a world where trust is moving towards distributed networks and machines that no one person, group, corporation or government owns. These networks have rock solid data integrity, zero downtime and financial incentives for ev everyone to participate. So I just want to talk about tokens for a little bit because they're, they're a really important a part of the DAO uh, uh, story. So uh, when, when, so when uh, ecosystems or platforms like Ethereum turned up, it turned out it was very easy for anybody to create their own coin. So I could write some, or copy and paste some code and create Mark coin very easily and run it on the blockchain as my own sort of cryptocurrency. Uh, but if I did that, and it wouldn't be very useful uh, if I tried to list it on a, on a cryptocurrency exchange. If they did accept it, nobody would want to buy it, so it wouldn't take on any real world value, so not much use. But imagine if we start to see these cryptocurrencies less as, as a currency, uh, but more as uh, kind of this digital asset, this, an object of value itself that has in, in intrinsic uh, incentive structures or scarcity or anything else built into the code, so it actually has value in itself. So the generic term we use for these is tokens, uh, and, and tokens are essentially a mechanism to introduce property, incentive structures, governance into the digital realm. So really important. So there's a whole field of token economics emerging that can be considered this kind of intersection between governance and, and game theory. So a token, uh, a unit of value that an organization creates to self-govern its business model and empower its users to interact with its products while facilitating the distribution and sharing of rewards and benefits. Uh, to all of its stakeholders. So prediction markets are another really important part of the DAO uh, conversation. So a prediction market is a market created uh, for the purpose of trading the outcome of events. So you essentially bet against each other, the market on an outcome, uh, how an outcome will turn out. out. So who will win the rugby, uh, what the weather will be like tomorrow, what the value of my company will be tomorrow. So you buy shares in the outcome that correlates to the uh, percentage chance that that event will occur. Once the event has occurred, you can cash out and win real money. So if, and it turns out if you have enough people with enough, with the right financial incentives, uh, then you, the accuracy improves. So the wisdom of the crowd turns out to be quite a powerful thing. So, and these concepts uh, existed before blockchain, but have had limited success. Uh, so decentralized permissionless prediction markets have a lot of advantages. Uh, lower fees, because you've got no, no middleman taking a cut, and, and you've got no potential uh, opportunity for the middleman to manipulate the market with insider trading, et cetera. So people can trust, trust it much more. So, but if we take that concept of uh, prediction markets and, and assume that they are good at making good decisions, uh, then how about we might use those, this sort of market to help us run our company? Uh, when should we launch this product? Should we open an office up in this country, etc., etc.? So speculators who believe they hold unique insight into the outcome are incentivized to participate and, and give us information to help us uh, predict that. And Google experimented with doing that for years by using its employees to do exactly that. Uh, and, uh, and the term futurarchy, which was defined a number of years ago uh, by called Robin Hansen, is this whole f new form of governance based on prediction markets. So if you think about it in, in layers, uh, we have this internet layer, which turned up a few decades ago, which gave us a, a communication protocol, allows us to move information at almost zero cost and disrupted a whole lot of business models. The second layer uh, is the blockchain, this, this trust infrastructure that allows untrusted parties to, uh, to interact. Uh, but the blockchain out of the box doesn't allow, us, doesn't allow us to work together towards a common goal, a common purpose, things that an organization or, or a community does with shared goals. So we kind of need this, this third layer, this uh, collaboration operating system, which we now know as, as a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization. Uh, so, and so this is a new type of organization that lives outside any geopolitical boundaries in theory. Uh, it has a governance mo model not controlled by a small group of people behind closed doors. Uh, the rules are encoded in transparent smart contracts. And generally these rules uh, fall into a cover off a few key things. One is reputation, uh, so some sort of non-transferable unit of measure that reflects the degree of alignment of a participant within a network of peers. Uh, value distribution, 
So, for example, tokens that are issued automatically whenever a contribution uh, is recognized as valuable by the majority of reputation in the network. Potentially a voting system, uh, so to allow sort of governance, so decisions made by the community, perhaps weighted more towards people with higher reputation uh, or token ownership. Uh, but ultimately a system that allows evolutionary purpose, uh, allows the, the entity to, to evolve and, and move potentially quite quickly as, as the agents within it want it, want it to go. So uh, that's the theory. Uh, what actually happened was a uh, soon after Ethereum turned up, uh, a few of the people sort of involved in the Ethereum project got together and tried to create the first DAO, and it was not very imaginatively called the DAO uh, in 2016. They went live as this kind of funds management uh, platform to, uh, to, to raise money for decentralized projects. And they basically went to the market and said, hey, look, we're here. If you, if you want to get, get part of it, send us, send, us some, send us your money. And they, it was at the height of the, the, the sort of craziness. And people, a lot of people, including myself, uh, sent them lots of money uh, to the tune of 150 million in about three weeks. And, but then they were hacked uh, and the thing collapsed. So it was a colossal failure. But uh, it was, it kind of, it got everybody thinking this, this stuff is, this could be the future. And so, so since then, uh, there's been a, a bunch of really interesting projects uh, making DAOs. Uh, MakerDAO is probably uh, one really interesting one. Uh, they basically created a stable coin, uh, you know, using very clever token economic center structures and put that within a DAO. Uh, and there's been a bunch of others. But, but it's really hard. I mean, to, 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 to create a, a DAO has been hard. You need a, a dedicated team, specialist team of developers. Uh, and yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not, not for everybody. So a bunch of organizations or groups have tried to tackle that problem and create uh, uh, a platform to create your own DAO. Essentially, the objective being to, uh, to uh, give anybody, make it as easy to, as creating a Facebook group or, or, a, or a WordPress site uh, to spin up a DAO. And uh, the two main projects, uh, there's a bunch of them out there, but there seems to be the two sort of leading players in this space, a DAO stack and Aragon. And uh, so I haven't, uh, I haven't, neither myself or Kate have had much to do with Aragon, but uh, DAO stack we have been involved in, and Kate will talk a little bit more about that community. But what I just want to talk about is a little bit about the sort of the technical side of how DAO stack works. Uh, so essentially, this is a slide from their website and talks about the different architectures, the different layers. So we've got sort of the smart contracts uh, down the bottom, and then we've got JavaScript libraries and, and applications at the top there. So, uh, I, but again, remember, this is open source. This is transparent. We can all see what's going on. Uh, there's no sort of corporation uh, sort, of, sort of controlling the, the source code for this stuff. Uh, and, and yeah, yeah, so this is kind of how, how they've, they've architected their system. Two, two important concepts here. We've got uh, the ownership structure. Uh, so a DAO can own four types of things. It can own external assets. So another token, Ether, for example, or an external token. It can own its, its own internal assets, its own tokens, its own DAO token. Uh, external rights, so it can have control of other DAOs or reputation in other DAOs. Uh, and internal rights, like its own internal reputation system. So, uh, so the other part of it is decentralized governance. So the process, and this is about the process of the agents, the, the sort of the agents within it, who typically have reputation, how they make decisions. They make proposals and, uh, and reputation holders, they vote, typically weighted, but not necessarily. And if, if the yes vote wins, then the DAO effectively says yes. So that's what sort of the governance part of it is. So, uh, but one of the key challenges, possibly the main challenge of DAOs, because uh, a small DAO isn't that useful. Uh, if you've got six people, you not really much point in putting it into a DAO. You can just talk to each other. Uh, but the, the really exciting bit of a DAO is if you can scale it, if you can have hundreds, thousands, millions of people participating. But that presents us with a, quite a fundamental problem uh, in that uh, we need to scale the number of voters, the people who can vote on things. We need to scale the number of proposers, people who are proposing ways to make the DAO better. And we need uh, a high throughput of pr proposals. So lots of proposals being ex executed on uh, per day, per week, whatever. So, and there's this inherent tension between this, this decentralization. Uh, we need wide distribution of voting power and reputation, but we also need scalability. We need number of decisions 
to be made over time as being quite fast, and we need resilience. So we need decisions representative of the majority of the DAO, otherwise it just, it just, just won't work. And it really comes down to this problem of scarcity of attention. Uh, if you can imagine if you've got a thousand people, they're all putting in proposals, uh, and uh, they don't have time to look at all the proposals. They're just whizzing past, and they just simply do not have enough time. The people with reputation, the people who should be voting, they don't have enough time to process it, so the whole thing doesn't scale uh, by default. So in a small DAO, everybody looks at everything. In a large DAO, no one looks at anything, and that's a fundamental problem. So DAO stack uh, have addressed this in, I think, quite an elegant way. It's a little bit unproven, but it's, it's been experimented on, and it seems to be quite an elegant solution to this uh, scarcity of attention problem. Uh, so essentially, uh, we've got three actors, three types of people. Uh, we've got proposers. So these are, uh, this can be anybody in the world. Uh, so anybody can jump in, make a proposal. I, for this DAO, which has got this, this strategy, this purpose, I propose that we create a new website or we do some social media or I build a new app for it or whatever. Uh, so anybody can submit a proposal and it's going to cost this much I'm going to charge for doing that thing. Uh, then we've got voters. So these are people uh, with uh, essentially weighted reputation holders uh, who can vote on proposals. These are the people who've got reputation. And reputation can actually be uh, based on, on, on a meritocracy, so what they've done to contribute before. Uh, or it can be economic, perhaps they've, they own lots of tokens, that's really up to the DAO to decide how they want to do that. Uh, and yeah, so the, the, the voters uh, vote on stuff. And here's the interesting bit is predictors. So we talked about prediction markets earlier on. So the predictors, which again can be anybody in the world, uh, can make a prediction if, uh, around if a proposal will succeed or fail. And they, they, they bet with, with real value, uh, the GEN token, which is a tradable token, uh, and they uh, have a look at all the proposals, and if they vote, if, if they can bet on the, the likelihood of the voters voting it uh, yes or no. And if, they, if they're right, when it does get voted in, they win money. If they, if they don't, they lose money. So that uh, essentially addresses the scarcity of attention problem uh, in theory, because what it does is, is the predictors will, will push the good proposals up to the top, and at a certain level, they get boosted in, in DAO stack terminology, and therefore the, the voters who've got limited time can only uh, need only focus their attention on the on the the the, uh, the proposals that that the market thinks are good. So, so that is that is how it works. So, uh, what I will do now is to pass on to Kate, who will talk a little bit about. Uh, well, I'll let her introduce herself. bit about you know why does this new organizational form called the DAO need to exist building on 
on what Mark has already brought up. Um, I'll go into some experiments that we've been testing and trying in the Genesis DAO um, and explain a bit more about what that is. And lastly, make the point that there needs to be a fourth layer in, in this new org organizational form, which is called soft governance, which I'll talk a bit more about as well. So my background is um, I'm part of the Inspiral business community, which is a distributed global community um, building apps and kind of cultural, cultural technology for new ways of working. So decentralized decision making with um, CoBudget is the app that is in Greater Than, which is the company that I've co-founded within that network called Inspiral. Greater Than, we offer self-management consulting services. So this is the concept that kind of is the practical element of what Mark was referring to in this concept of Teal. It's how do we work with a lot of autonomy, removing hierarchy um, and centralization and actually get work done. So that's self-management. Um, so, you know, Mark already talked a bit about why we're in a bit of a, a bad situation at this current point in history. Um, with the kind of the business model of the internet is primarily surveillance. Um, as you can see, of the five big five US tech firms, at least three can be argued to have made their way with anti rivalrous products, creating monosophonies via zero marginal cost. And Facebook and Google now have direct influence of, over nearly three quarters of all internet traffic. So these organizational forms, yeah, it's, they're very hard to compete with with the current uh, infrastructure of Web2. So there's a bunch of us um, in this kind of movement of the blockchain who are congregating around the Web3 camp. Um, and there's a really great article that I'll share after the talk, uh, kind of articulating these five camps of crypto. But the Web3 camp, uh, really thinking about how the governance architecture um, of, of blockchain can create these opportunities for better governance and new organizational structures, particularly DAOs. So building on that, there's been a lot of work done in economics um, around this concept of the local knowledge problem, which is that the data required for, to, for good decisions can't actually be held by one central authority. We actually do need to engage the, the knowledge of the crowd. Um, and, you know, when we look at the situation that the world is in right now, uh, with, yeah, pretty rapidly rising temperatures across the globe, the sixth, uh, the sixth mass extinction of humanity, of the, of the world, sorry, um, we actually need to go outside the structures that were created for organizational forms, you know, many, many, many years ago in the industrial age, um, in the, the Fordist age, where your building, your organization was really structured for a different time with different, different problems and different opportunities. Um, so in these troubled, uncertain times, we don't need more command and control. We need better ways to engage everyone's intelligence in solving challenges and crises as they arise. And this is a quote by a woman, Margaret J. Wheatley, who writes a lot about self-management in the kind of Frederick Lelou kind of field. So moving on to DAOs, what is a DAO? So obviously the first was the, the DAO in 2013. Uh, it's a new kind of organization that offers decentralization or the lack of a central decision-making and enforcing uh, node. The transparency is, is crucial and you basically have a form of autonomous governance, which means that the the governance is conducted by the agents rather than a small elect group. So this, this is probably too many words on a slide, but there's so no individual shareholder or founder can single handedly dictate the fate of the organization, which is one of the, you know, the, the main infrastructure problems with, with uh, companies and corporations these days. The CEO, the management, the executives, they're not answerable to stakeholders necessarily, they're answerable to the board and to um, increasing the, the, the share price at, at all cost. 
So in a DAO, the members of the organization allocate resources by conducting a vote and curating different proposals for what work should be done. Um, there is con complete transparency of every transaction, so they run on public blockchains. Every action the DAO performs leaves a trail that can be verified. So there should be no directives from the top or a central node of power and authority or explicit coordination. But of course, that does happen. Um, so decentralized organizations are really good at coordinating resources when not all parties know each other, aligning large numbers of stakeholders towards shared goals, tracking and validating participation and contribution to a project, running organizations in a way that's resistant to censorship, accommodating a wide level of uh, contributions and allowing people and entities to work in a jurisdiction agnostic uh, fashion. So right now, um, we are really in this innovator part of the life cycle adoption curve. There's been a handful of DAOs and with Genesis, um, which I'll talk a bit more about now, you know, we're right down here. This is the start of the wave. Um, so a lot of what I'll be talking about is with this heuristic in mind. This is not like a really, really mature organizational structure. We are still in the experiment phase. Um, and the DAOs that are springing up are very much, um, they have the criteria of, uh, of the slide above. They have those problems. Otherwise, it's going to be, in my opinion, a bit of a leap to convince, you know, a local government to start using a DAO unless they, and also unless, you know, the users actually understand a bit about the technology, security management, jumping onto the blockchain and using tokens and cryptocurrency. So with that in mind, I'll talk a bit about Genesis DAO, which is the first DAO of DAO stack. Um, DAO stack raised 30 million in May 2018. And the idea is that um, via the Gen token, the Genesis DAO would be the kind of ecosystem coordinated DAO that would eventually control or control, be the, the treasury for uh, that raise. But unlike the, the, the DAO, which um, kind of maybe put all the money in a bit too soon, the, the idea behind Genesis is that little by little, um, we test it, the, the agents within the DAO called pollinators kind of figure out how to be a DAO. Um, we we um, are basically experimenting and making sure, trying to figure out what attack vectors are there, trying to break things. Um, and little by little, DAO stack will uh, increase the amount of money flowing through to this um, as they bring out different iterations of the tool Alchemy. So Alchemy is basically a collaborative budget management tool which enacts the, the, the will of the, the DAO. Um, it's the kind of first piece of governance architecture and this is a screenshot of um, the, the first version called uh, Genesis Alpha or 2.0. Um, so you can see it's kind of like quite basic and that it is important to remember that this technology is in a, an early phase. Um, so Mark talked a bit about how this works and I'm not going to stay on it for too long. Um, but so uh, alchemy is basically the way that the group decides what work should be done for how much by who. Um, so you can see this is Genesis, uh, sorry, Alchemy Earth, which is just about to launch. These are just screenshots. So basically you make a proposal. Hey, this is the, the title of what I want to do. I want, I'm going to achieve these things. This is why it's important. This is why it meets the, the mandate and the, the purpose of the DAO. Um, link to your URL if you have that. Um, how much you need to complete the proposal. Um, your public key and basically try to you're trying to put as much detail in this as possible to convince the other members of the DAO this is a good use of the collective uh, money um, and then you submit and basically this is a, a shot of you know different uh, proposals within a DAO this is the Dutch X DAO and you can see the uh, basically people are voting um, these, these are displayed with the hand signals. Um, and the people are voting with reputation. So it's not like an absolute majority, it's a majority of reputation. 
Um, this is a list of all the reputation holders, little by little. The DAO can decide on its own identity kind of per protocol. Um, it can say all proposals, all proposers must link their identity, otherwise it's a no-go, or they can say, no, we don't need identity here, or this one is obviously a bit of both right now, perhaps the soft protocol hasn't been decided. And you can see the reputation that they've got uh, on the right there. Um, there's the, the total of ether in the group and how many gen tokens, um, a history on the side, how many proposals have been redeemed, the history of all proposals submitted and passed, um, and FAQs down the bottom. So this is just what a proposal looks like uh, up close, and you can see that this is being boosted, which means that someone has staked on it and said, yes, I really believe that this is going to pass, and I'm willing to bet my to bet on it. Um, and that means that if it fails, they lose their, their stake. Um, this is quite interesting. So to pass, it's 413 gen. This is the prediction. And fail is 72.15. And they've st this, proposed, this staker has uh, staked 1.2 gen, so they'll lose that. There's a discussion function down the bottom, which uh, you know, is where you say, hey, I think this, in my opinion, this is not a great proposal for these reasons. And someone might say, well, I disagree, and I'm going to enact that with my uh, interaction by, by voting or staking. So these are some of the DAOs that exist right now. There's a, sorry, two cut off at the bottom. Um, and Genesis itself, um, which is this, this first DAO, DAO stack, which is in time where they want to put the treasury and the minting keys of DAO stack. But as, as I said, little by little, we are experimenting, we're rolling out new, new dApps um, to figure out how to be a DAO together. So this is just a bit about what we've done in our, in our history. We've, passed two, we've produced 230 proposals, um, passing 121. Um, and a lot of those were proposals to gain reputation to participate in the DAO but many of them were proposals to actually to work to produce the things that we need in the DAO. Um, a couple of really interesting ones were uh, the DAO Explorer, an interface that a couple of open source developers built because they saw the need for um, agents to kind of track what things were happening in the DAO rather than just on the Alchemy DAP interface. Um, so we are, we've been putting about 60 Ether per month through it um, yeah, which has obviously fluctuated, the, the value of that's fluctuated a lot, which has actually brought up a lot of questions for, you know, how we make decisions around managing money, which is all very interesting. And we've grown by 125% from 54 members to 123 today. Um, it's remained decentralized with most users controlling 0.7 to 3.2% of the total voting power. So our first proposal <laughs> in July 2018 was like, okay, how are we going to set out some precedents for what a good proposal looks like? What kind of things do we want to fund? They actually funded the, uh, the Inspiral book, which is the collective that I'm part of, which is a great. This book is about some, some of the soft governance um, practices of decentralization, and I'm going to get to a little bit more about what that means shortly. So Basically, the agents in the DAO said, yes, we think this is a good use of, of the money. We can see how this benefits the Genesis DAO. We are willing to support it. And so that uh, flowed through to the book. Um, we had December 2018 was a really interesting incident. Um, this is the first time we saw a lot of uh, divergence in whether this proposal was a good idea. This is the accountability task force, which is because um, we're pretty early in this technology, we don't have, like, it's off chain to figure out what happens if a pro proposal is not delivered on or someone, you know, says they're going to do something and they don't. So this accountability task force saw that this was a need that the DAO had and kind of got together and made a proposal that they themselves would do this, you know, automated Turk work. 
Um, there's four of them, and basically what happens is they f if I say, okay, I'm, I need 20 ether to um, do five meetups, and these are the deliverables, and I only do two of them, and I don't um, send through any of the deliverables, I can expect just a message from someone from the accountability task force just checking in, and um, yeah. A really interesting incident with them is they, one of the founders of Dowstack had raised a proposal to do, um, to do some work in the, on an identity function and obviously just had got away from them and they'd engaged someone in Israel to do this work and you know as things happen in technology projects that hadn't been delivered on yet, someone else had built an identity function so the ATF got onto it and um, with kind of a soft protocol forcing function uh, got uh, this founder to, to get track down the money and give it back to the DAO, which obviously is possible because we're only 123 people and we're just, you know, a lot of this off-chain work is figuring out what needs to be built for when we do scale from, you know, 123 to, to 5,000, which is the goal. And as Mark said, is the goal of DAOs. It really is, um, DAO stack especially is thinking about working with scalable DAOs, so DAOs of, you know, 1,000, 5,000, 100,000. So the basically, um, you can see at the top there that there was quite a split vote. Um, and this, there were, yeah, 30 comments saying just with a lot of like, we don't believe that this is the right thing to do. A bunch of people came in really late and saw that this was about to pass and kind of voted the other way. So the timeout function at the top this went, on, this went on for 18 days and it went from you know, winning to losing probably like 18 times, <laughs> which is really interesting. So this is all in the history of the Dark Explorer if you do want to check it out. So we also were hacked. <laughs> so um, in February, someone drained 139 ETH via a bug, which is COO, uh, sorry, CTO Adam here writing a technical analysis of this. He said, described it as a very elegant hack. Um, so this is just proof that, yeah, we're not ready to put the whole treasury in yet. It might take a while and that's okay. Um, we really need to do a lot of auditing and testing of, of the DAP and of any other infrastructure that is built. So the last part of this talk is about kind of my f role or function in the Genesis DAO, which is, uh, you know, community management stuff. Um, and this is where, like, bridging my background in kind of organizational design, um, self-management, coaching, and training. Um, there's, you know, we, we do need this Im infrastructure and architecture to exist to, to evolve beyond the constraints of current organizational forms because they are constrained. The design is not there to support another way of working and being. But I personally don't think that just going fully with the kind of the notion that automation is in the middle, you know, humans can't be trusted. They're the reasons why organ organizations are corrupted, which may be true, but there's still a lot of room for, in this, in Genesis in particular, proposals pass, the, the protocol performs its function, and then people need to deliver the work. And that's where um, self-management comes in, and soft governance. So what are the soft off-chain protocols that we agree on as humans that need to exist outside the hard protocols? So we wrote this book called The Tao, the Tao of the Tao, um, just, which is the first chapter in like a, a guidebook for how to set up your own Tao, and this is just dealing with some of the questions you need to ask yourselves and that need to be very explicit and clear before you start a DAO and that is you know what is your purpose what is what are you really trying to achieve here um, what is the culture you want to create what happens when you get some trolls in your group who are not quite hacking things but are making things very hard um, I yeah don't think that hard protocols can solve some of these things although they will have to come a long way if we will see DAOs of 10,000 people Ah, so this is a slide that hasn't worked, but it's building on Mark's um, slide set of, of the three levels of decentralized organizations. Do you remember what they were? Uh, what's the internet blockchain DAO? That's 
yeah, the internet goes above, the blockchain, um, the DAO. And I'm saying that soft governance needs to be at kind of underlying all of that. Ah, here we go. So soft, we've got the internet, which is a communication protocol, the blockchain, which is the trust protocol, and the decentralized autonomous organization. So my, my thesis is that you still need these, these self-management, soft governance um, constructs for things to really work, and, and more than that, for them to be worthwhile. I won't talk about that now, though. So this is just us. This is an example of some soft governance happening which is us meeting uh, every week on a Zoom call, just trying to answer some of these questions. What, is, what, are, what are we aiming for right now? What are our kind of KPIs? What are we trying to deliver? How can we make sense of this really chaotic, dynamic space of the blockchain and figure out how we are aligning, how we're making decisions that need, need to happen before we send things up to a proposal on Genesis, sorry, on Alchemy. So that's all from me. I'm not going to talk anymore. If you do want to be part of Genesis, um, we are really interested in bringing on people that are doers, basically. Um, we're in the, the part of our life cycle where we have had, we've been around since July, we've passed all these proposals. We are really, we're about to launch um, Alchemy Earth, which is the new model of um, the new DAP, or the new version of the DAP. Um, there's all these other DAOs forming with DAOSAC, like DXDAO, PokerDAO, Psychedelic Society DAO, and we want people in Genesis pollinating, basically figuring out how to, to survive and thrive and create the foundations of a DAO so that they can go pollinate and be part of all these other DAOs. Um, so get in touch with me, and especially if you're a builder, designer, researcher, legal brain, or yeah, a doer. Thank you.